Yeah, well, I exactly. Think, I think what has happened within the evangelical world is that we have misunderstood what the Great Commission is. We've changed the Great Commission to go and make converts instead of go and make disciples. What God wants us to do is to make people who are growing in their faith becoming dynamic in their faith. Not just that, oh, I prayed the prayer, now I can go out and do whatever I want. Right. And God, all my sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. I don't have to worry about that anymore. No, mm -hmm. he wants you to grow in your knowledge of God, in your relationship with him, with others, so that you can become a true disciple. And that will get you into scripture. Absolutely. That will get you to become somebody who understands more, or who's experiencing more of the fruit of the spirit in your life consistently, instead of just that, well, I got a get out of jail free card, you know? Right. Again, right. It's not just right. go and make converts, it's go and make disciples and what mm -hmm. is a disciple really all of them and i think yeah. that's really the where the, the christian church has fallen short that the evangelical church has fallen short in the last number of years that we we've kind of changed the idea from building disciples into converts and mm -hmm. uh we need to, to get back to building disciples who are growing in their faith becoming mature in their walk with god yeah, I'm really happy that you brought up the Great Commission because I was gonna, I was gonna want to ask you the question: How has believing ultimate uh, restoration changed how you go about sharing your faith or going about evangelism? I talk about my faith all the time. It's interesting, uh, and I don't because I, I work in the secular world. Uh, now I'm older, <laughs> so, although I still work there. But uh, after um, COVID hit. Uh, I don't get into New York City very often because you have to have, uh, it, it just doesn't work. Everything right, is closed right. down. And so yeah. now because of the internet, I actually, like right now we're Zooming. I'm in Connecticut, you're in Hawaii, and we can actually right. talk in real time to one another. Well, actually mm -hmm. the commercials that I do, like the commercials for Puffs, um, I'm in my home studio and they're in New York. In fact, one of the Puffs uh, commercials that we did a little, uh, maybe few months after COVID hit, um, I just said, well, you know, where are you? Well, the producer was in Brooklyn. The engineer was in Long Island. One wow. of the other producers was in Australia because oh, she wow. was from Australia, went back home to visit her family. And so it's three o'clock in the morning for her. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> We're doing the recording session. Kind of fascinating, but you can do that kind of thing. And um, with uh, the way technology and everything else works there. With regard to my faith, I would talk to people all the time about my faith. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I, what I would find is that I would talk to them and I would ask them, well, their faith, what do they think of, you know? And if you're willing to listen to people tell you what they think, they'll be willing to listen to you tell them about what you think. And what I've convinced, what I became convinced of was that if you really want to be an effective evangelist or uh, ministering in the Christian world, what you've got to focus on is building relationships. If you build a relationship with someone, the time will come when you are just naturally bring in something from scripture. I mean, hmm. There were many times where I would talk to people and they're having problems in their marriage. Well, my wife and I just celebrated our 51st wedding anniversary. Wow! I'm more in love with my wife now than I was when I first got married. We have had all kinds of issues over the time. I and mean, we've had knockdowns, uh, drag. <laughs> fights you know and in fact one of the I, somebody asked me uh recently well how'd you get to 51 years what was the secret i said well it was my wife because my wife i was the kind of guy that if a problem came up look we'll talk about it tomorrow you know we'll just kind of let it ride it's not a big deal we'll talk about it tomorrow she's a type of person says, no no we gotta talk about it now so it's three o'clock in the morning and we're arguing about this particular thing but we mm. dealt with we dealt with it right away. And then the next morning, it was gone. And there have been maybe two or three times in my life, my relationship with her, where I didn't do that. I was the one that did some, we'll talk about it in the morning. It was worse in the morning. But most divorces come because you've got a problem, and another problem, and another problem. And these are all small problems, but they build and build and build, and suddenly you got this gigantic mouth built out of little, tiny, small problems. Well, anyway, so I would be able to share with people because people come along and they want to know about um and that by the way 
don't let the sun go down to your wrath. Right? That's one of the things. Deal with problems as they come up. That's a biblical principle. I would share yeah. people with people about biblical principles. Um, problems with their children. You know, I've got five children, and we homeschooled our kids. And one of the big questions was always, homeschool your kids. And this was when it was not a popular thing. When we first started homeschooling, it was not necessarily legal to do that in uh, in all the, the states around the country. And uh, in fact, we were in Massachusetts at the time, and uh, there was a court case that went to the state Supreme Court to find out wow. whether it was legal for people to actually teach their children at home. It ended up mm -hmm. being um, decided in favor of homeschooling. But anyway, so uh, I was always um, very much involved with my children. I tried to apply biblical principles of discipline and of loving uh, to my children. And so people having problems with their kids, they would come and I got a chance to talk to them from a biblical perspective and yeah. lead them into talking about God and God's word and uh, Jesus Christ and what Christ has done in my life, sharing my, my testimony with people about how I transformed my life in 1969. Why? Mm. Because I saw that God was the boss and I was the servant instead of the other way around. I don't tell God what to do. He tells me what to do. And as I fit in with God's plan for life, and I experience the fruit of the spirit increasingly. And so anyway, it just would, as I build relationships with people, but because of ultimate restoration, I'm not afraid of anybody. I'm not afraid that I can't talk to them. There was one guy that came into the, my agent's office one day. He's on the phone and, uh, yep, yeah, we're going to get married. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah, I'm excited about it, too. In June. Uh-huh. Oh, that's really great. Yeah, thanks a lot. Bye. So I engaged in a conversation and said, oh, you're getting married. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what's her name? Oh, his name is. I thought, oh, okay, here's a guy guy, right? He's going to get married to this other gay person. I said, how does that work? That was a legitimate question I had. How does that work? I mean, does one of you take more of the domestic side of things or one of you take more of the providing type of things? Whose last name do you take? Um, or, or do you hyphenate the last name? You know, I just was asking some honest questions and establishing a relationship with this guy. I didn't have to try to either tell him he was a sinner and going, you know, doing these terrible, horrible things or to try to convert him right away. I could just establish a relationship with him knowing that that's going to happen. Another guy that was, um, uh, he actually was uh, doing recording session, uh, auditioning me mm -hmm. on a number of occasions. He was actually somebody that worked with my agent. And uh, I knew that he was gay and uh, he was going to, uh, he never told me that. And uh, he never mentioned it to me, but he knew where I stood in terms of my faith, that I was an evangelical Christian. And you know, I talked about that all the time. And um, uh, so I go into a, an audition this one time and he said to me, um, by the way, I'm going to be moving to uh, San Francisco. I I'm leaving here. I'm going to move to San Francisco. Oh, that's great, Noel. That's really wonderful to hear. Um, could I pray for you? Yeah, that'd be great. So I prayed for him, you know, that God would guide him and that God would work in his life. And God would lead him increasingly to a, a dynamic life and, and provide for the needs that he has there. I finished the prayer. He said, you know, my, my family hates me. They think I'm this terrible, wicked person. And uh, I thought, when he goes out to San Francisco, if he continues to pursue that lifestyle, I'm convinced that he will come to a point where he realizes that it's a dead end. And I want him to know that there was this evangelical that believed that the Bible was true, that he talked to numerous times over the, the years back in New York, who loved him and yet was pursuing truth so that when he comes to the end of his rope, he'll say, maybe I'll look into that. Oh. So those are the kinds of things that happen. Another guy, I'll just say one other story. Um, he was a, a, a very successful announcer. Uh, you would have heard his voice on a lot of different things. And uh, he was writing a book on spiritual things and I was writing a book on spiritual things. And um, so we would talk about our books at different times. And he was way far left. I'm way far right, okay, as far as he was concerned, what was going on there. And uh, so anyway, one day, uh, but I had a good relationship with him. So one day, we're on the train, because we both were from Connecticut, and we happened to be on the train, sat down together, talking about these things. And he was waxing eloquent about uh, how he hated 
the current administration and this was all this is for you know, these people are just after money 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 everybody's after money 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 they don't care about people they just want money and so i looked at him i said jeff what percentage of your income do you give away <laughs> he's kind of shocked i don't know um maybe one percent i give i make less money than you do by far but I give away a significantly larger percentage of my income than you do of yours. You talk about how you love people, but you're just keeping all your money for yourself. You're not helping anybody. He <laughs> looked at me and said, oh, you sure got me there. <laughs> <laughs> I said, um, um, you know, I, I worked at the Bowery Mission and I, I help at a homeless area there. I, I actually pick it against abortion because I'm against abortion. Mm -hmm. I do some things that are done because this is where my faith is leading me. Um, you're a hypocrite. You talk about how you want to help people, but you're not helping anybody. Mm -hmm. And I said, Jeff, have you ever actually asked God if he was real? Oh, I can't say that I ever have. And I said, well, let me just encourage you to do that. You get home, just engage God in a conversation. Say, God, I just want to know, if you are real, would you please reveal yourself to me? And then I said, but don't do that unless you're really serious, because if God is real, and if he does reveal himself to you, you will probably have to make some changes in your lifestyle. So don't do it unless you're really serious. He got off the train. I got off the train. Didn't see him for a couple of months. Ran into him in the uh, subway a couple months later. And uh, I said, uh, Jeff, good to see you. Uh, good to see you too, George. I said, By the way, you ever pray that prayer? <laughs> this is his words. Just, well, as a matter of fact, me and him, we had a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was, it was so cute, right? The next wow. time I saw him, the next time I saw him was a few months later, the night before he died. Wow. wow. He, uh, he had been diagnosed with uh, brain cancer. And I, nobody knew, I mean, I didn't know anything about it until all of a sudden somebody called me and said, by the way, did you hear about Jeff? Uh, he's di he was diagnosed with brain cancer. He's in the hospital. It, it looks like he's going to die. Hmm. Well, I knew where he lived. And I knew there was a hospital near there that I could pro that he probably was in. And so I called the hospital. And I said, "Is uh, so and so in your in the hospital?" Yes, he is. Uh, can he have visitors? Yeah, yeah, you can come down. Visit. And so I went down, and I'm going up to the, the floor where he was on, and uh, I walked up to the nurses' station. I said, uh, "I would like to see." This person, uh, is, is it okay for me to go in there? Oh, yeah, I can go. And on my way to the door, I'm saying, God, please don't have anybody else in there because I know that if I go in there and he's really sick the way he's supposed to be sick, they're going to kick me out. They don't know me from Adam. Right? I walked in, he was all alone. He couldn't talk. And I said to him, uh, said, uh, Jeff, do you know who I am? And he nodded his head. Do you want me to leave? He shook his head. I said, you know, we didn't realize just how significant that conversation we had was about God. Mm -hmm. And over the years, different questions that we've had about God. Um, wow. But I pray for you. And I prayed for him. I finished my prayer. His wife came in and kicked me out. <laughs> <laughs> I, went to his I went to his funeral. And it was interesting. There were several people that talked uh, at his funeral about how there was something different about him in the, the, the previous weeks and months prior to his uh, dying, and they were attributing it to the fact that I think I think he knew he was going to die. Hmm. I attributed it to the fact that he actually entered into a personal relationship with God. Whether he did or not, I don't know because I wasn't hmm. able to actually ask him that time. But um, I had established a relationship with him, and I could talk to him freely. I wasn't. I didn't have to get him to pray a prayer. I didn't have hmm. to get him to agree with me on something. He could stay disagreeing with me as much as he wanted to. Hmm. But I could be free to share my thoughts with him and allow him to share his thoughts with me, knowing that eventually God is going to win. That's yeah. the thing. God is going to win. Like I said at that one point in our conversation, God's love is unconditional. His power is irresistible. And he never gives up. And that's what, to me, has given me a freedom to be able to interact with just about anybody. 